Sorry, that's got stuck. There we go. Okay, I think I'm set. <laughs> and now my phone is falling off. It's been one of those days, I have to say. So um, let's hope it's not a, um, a sign of what Tech 2.2 is going to be like for everyone, that me being frazzled at the technology or not quite working is not what's going to happen when we start to implement uh, Tech 2.2. Uh, Lila introduced me, you know, with the work. <laughs> Um, so um, I actually am one of the co-founders and directors of Utopia, uh, where a digital accessibility and inclusive design agency, we actually uh, operate out of both Australia and New Zealand, so we have Australian and New Zealand entities. I've got 14 members here in New Zealand, of which two are on the Zoom call at the moment, um, monitoring that and, and um, fixing anything that, that might go wrong. And uh, I kind of love WCAG. Uh, I both love and hate it in, in some respects. So uh, I love it because I actually think it gives us a great basis to work from. And I hate it because so often people equate accessibility with WCAG. So they go, oh, yeah, my product is WCAG 2.2 level AA conformant. That means everyone, including people with disabilities, can use my product. And it's not always the case. Just because we meet a standard doesn't necessarily mean things are reusable. So uh, at the same time, though, there is so much good stuff in WCAG that tells us all the different things that we can do to make an experience more accessible. And it also crosses a whole lot of different disabilities. And certainly the updates to WCAG 2.1 and 2.2 did address some of those areas or those communities that were not being terribly well represented by the original version of the K2.0. And that includes people with low vision, um, people with cognitive impairment or who are neurodiverse, and also mobile phone users because we had 2.0 was actually released the same year as the very first iPhone. So no one was really thinking about small touch screens and that kind of thing. So obviously they introduced that as well. But we're here today to talk about the 2.2 update and I'm just gonna pause and actually go and fix up my slides so that you can see them. So the lovely people online, we actually have 18 people online. I would say we've probably got about 10 here in person. So lovely community. And let me... Uh, do this as the wonderful um, people online get a very big close-up of me. Sorry about that, people. And I just need to share my screen. And we are sharing this. And let me just make sure these go away. Hypothetic meeting controls. Minimize that. And I think we're good to go. I am just going to pull my trusty phone out and check whether my team is manually messaging me to say anything is wrong with what I've just done. Uh, the wonders of technology. You can see the screen. I think we're good to go. All right, popping the phone away. Get started. Get started and get started. And my little thing doesn't work. <laughs> I did test this. Sorry, people. Works. Yes, okay. That's actually my fault, not his fault, so I can't really <laughs> blame it. <laughs> so you will get used to me. This is kind of the way that any event that I either present at or I run um, works. 
<laughs> I will say though that I love interactivity and questions. So for those that are here, if you do have any questions or that kind of thing, please feel free to shoot up your hand shout out. Um, Pranita, who is on the Zoom call. Uh, Pranita, if I guess we can check that I can hear you, but anyway, we'll, work, we'll see whether that works. Um, if you do get any questions through the chat or a QA that you feel would be best answered as we present, just yell out as well. Okay, a little bit about WCAG 2.2. So, my, my usual questions to anyone is how many people have attempted to read WCAG? So in the room, I've got about oh, a bit over half. I'm not sure what we're looking like online. Hopefully there's a few people responding in chat. Uh, the next question, how many people like reading with me? I think there are people. <laughs> wonder if there's anyone on the chat. So occasionally I get one or two that say, yes, actually I do enjoy reading with me. I'm probably one of them, but I don't think I count. Um, WCAG, look, it's a great document, but it, it, at the end of the day, it is a standard and it tends to be quite hard to understand, particularly if you're starting out in accessibility. So as we talk about WCAG 2.2 today, um, each of the success criteria that I'll go, go through, we've actually tried to write a bit of a plain language version of what that criteria is. It's not going to be perfect. It's not going to cover everything, but hopefully... It is a little bit more memorable for you as we talk about those different um, new success criteria. And then, of course, we're going to unpack them a little bit. So, I just wanted to recap that when we do talk about um, a new version of WCAG, it is actually an extension to the original version. So, for instance, we've got all our lovely WCAG 2.1 criteria, and 2.2 is actually adding some new information. So for 2.2, we actually have nine new success criteria, two level A, five double A, and then two triple A, all of which we will be touching on in the next, I think I'm supposed to have 40 minutes. It's probably going to be an hour, just because. <laughs> Um, and also we've got three kind of minor updates. We've got one renaming of a, a, one of those uh, 2.1 criteria. We've got one that's actually been assigned a new level and we've got one that's been removed, which actually only happened in the last few months. Now, today, any information I share with you is going to be um, what is currently available in the um, document. So, WCAG 2.2 hasn't been finalised yet. When it gets to that recommendation, which, fingers crossed, April, I say that because it was supposed to be December two years ago that it was going to be ready. I keep getting pushed and pushed and pushed for various reasons. But today, all the information comes from the current candidate recommendation, which was released in January, January 25th from memory. Uh, once it goes over, it gets through the candidate recommendation, it goes to what's called proposed recommendation, where people like myself who represent or are um, members of the W3P who create the standard get to vote on it, and then it goes to recommendation and it's done and dusted and everyone brings a big sigh of relief. All right, let's go straight into the new 2.2 success criteria, starting with consistent help. So uh, this has been summarised. First of all, I should say consistent help is a level A criteria. And uh, we've summarised this success criteria and as help channels can be found in a consistent location across the product. I've actually started with an easy one. There's two that I am dreading, one in particular that I was like, today I, I posted in Slack in our rant channel and I'm just like, it's, this criteria is called focus appearance and I'm just like, focus appearance, rant, done. <laughs> Don't want to talk about it. This one though is a nice easy one that we can start with. So this particular criteria is all about uh, helping people to find help when they need it. So if you get stuck along the way, this could be, for instance, maybe someone with a cognitive impairment or difficulty with attention. You want to be able to find that help quickly and easily as you're trying to complete a task. Now, this particular criteria doesn't actually say we have to provide help channels. It only applies if the help channels are already there. 
cost quite enough. It's a really good thing. It's just not covered under this particular criteria. So if we've got those health channels, they need to be consistently presented. So what do we call a health channel? Um, but basically anything that is going to allow someone to contact you or ask a question or get help. Uh, so examples uh, include uh, contact details, so human contact details like a phone number to ring you up or store hours if they want to come in and talk to you. Uh, second help channel is human contact options, so ones that don't necessarily are not details to contact a human directly, but it could be a contact form that you can send off. You might be able to contact an organisation through social media channels. You might have a chat that is actually chat, chatting with a human. That's the second sort of form of help channels. Uh, third are self-help options, so anything like frequently asked questions and support pages and the like. And then lastly, any sort of automated help, so a good old chatbot is a great example. And oh, there we go. And I should mention for any of you Marvel fans, anyone know who's in the top corner? I got one nod. <laughs> Two nods. So this is Loki. For any Marvel fans, you'll know in one of the movies, um, they say, you know, we um, want to get help, and they're doing this little skit. So of course. So one little thing I wanted to call out is um, when we talk about health channels or a health mechanism, which is kind of the language that's used in the actual success criteria, this also applies to um, links that actually link off to health function. So the example we have here is Barclays and we have a contact us link that's going to take you probably to a contact us page with some details. That is considered a help mechanism, even though it's linking off to the page with all those details, because it is there, it's consistent, it's the type of thing we find in the header or footer or that kind of thing that does apply under this category. So we want to see that in a consistent manner. So in this case, top right, main nav, it's not going to move, it's not going to change, basically tick with, with um, met this particular criteria. But it also applies to sort of bigger things. So the example I have on screen is Sephora, um, the website, and we have a chat box. Um, but either way, you know, it's got a lot more things to it. It's got the, the text box, it's got the messages. Once again, we want that to be in a consistent location and not just visually, but also, for instance, for our screen reader users that might be consuming the page via audio. So for each of these criteria, I'm going to point out who we think is ultimately responsible to drive this particular criteria. And this one, and you'll get sick of me saying, sign is the primary responsibility. And actually, I think nearly all success criteria within 2.2 is led by design. I think there's a few um, that uh, have uh, di sort of differences, but this one's clearly a design based issue. Engineering does have a responsibility as well um, to both implement that and also make it consistent for our screen reader users. And in every single example, test is always going to have. A, um, a role because if your testers are testing everything, they're going to test these criteria. So I'm not going to mention that one again. All right, how's everyone feeling? Oh, I've got a few smiles, a few thumbs up. Hopefully, people online are also feeling good. Uh, it only gets harder from here, sorry. <laughs> okay, next criteria redundant entry. Uh, it's also a level eight criteria, and we've summarized this as. People shouldn't have to re-enter information that already provided by, well, let me start that again. People shouldn't have to re-enter information that already provided while completing a task. So key thing here while completing a task. So if you've got a task that you want to do, let's say you need to log into a system and then you might need to add some things to your cart and then you need to check out, so then you need to pay, that's kind of considered a task. This doesn't apply if people navigate away from the task. So if they go and they shut the browser or anything like that, even if they're logged in, technically that doesn't apply to this one. Also, if there are any security risks with this one, it, it also doesn't apply. 
For this one, what we're really focused on is just, you know, if I've already put certain information in, so the most common example here is when you have to put in a billing and shipping address. And any form that has been done, designed well, accessibility or otherwise, usually has that little tick box where you might put in your shipping address and it says, do you want to, you know, do you want to use this as your billing address or vice versa? That is a perfect example of where this criteria kicks in because we don't want people to have to re-enter information. It takes more time. Um, if they have a um, motor impairment, you know, they, that might, you know, again, take more time or, or they're actually prone to making mistakes. So this one, you know, again, it's a little bit of a common sense one to focus. If you're doing good UX, you're probably going to take this one off. There is a bit of sort of minutiae in this. It's like if you can copy and paste that same information that you put in before, you're okay. You know, the thing about them okay is they always have this, what I call the lowest common denominator or the exceptions that almost feel like a get out of jail free card sometimes. It's still effort for the person to copy and paste, but technically under this criteria, that's okay. Um, you might auto populate information that has been entered before. You might um, have that information available to select from, say, a drop down, or maybe an opt in like the billing and shipping where you tick a checkbox and it sort of copies that information, so you're sort of opting into, hey, I do want to reuse this information. So there's lots of little different ways that we can do it, but ultimately it's don't ask people to put in information again, particularly if it's a stepped process. Once again, for me, this is driven by design engineering implements. I do think content has a role because we do want to have all of that lovely information, you know, very clear with labels and what have you. So I have to say content does play a role in this one and test, yeah, always. My least favorite criteria. I actually forgot I wanted to put a slide in to show you what this one line interactive elements had an easy to see focus indicator. So this is focus appearance success criteria, double A. And I wanted to show you what the success criteria looks like. It's about 20 lines long. It's got all these conditions. So I don't blame you if at the end of this little bit, you're like, oh, please just, yeah. Put me out of my misery, I'm done. <laughs> it's just a bit of a gnarly one. I will say though, we I have that little risk there because when success criteria get to candidate recommendation, if they feel like the criteria may not make it to that final stage, they mark it as a risk. So this one is a little bit contentious. Um, basically what they're doing now in the candidate recommendation is they gather a whole heap of examples to make sure that the criteria works and can be tested appropriately and covers all the different scenarios and what have you. So obviously they have enough concerns here to, to market at risk. It's a really important criteria, but I don't know if it's complex. <laughs> now, this criteria, though, it is all about your focus indicator. So if you've ever tapped around a website or the like and you have a little outline that sort of pops up to show you what element you've tapped to, that's what the focus indicator is. And if we kind of boil down to what that easy to see, which is what I really summarise this criteria into, it comes down to two parts. The first is what we call the area of focus. So um, the example at the very top and the, well, actually the two examples at the top are examples of where the focus indicator encloses the element. So it encloses the button, it's wrapped all around it. The first one has a gap in between. So it's sort of a little bit offset from the button. The second one is hugging the button. So it's kind of one or two pixels fatter than the, the normal button. But either way, it's called, it encloses. So that's our kind of first criteria that we'll have to dig into in a sec. Um, the second one is that if you don't do that, that it's a minimum focus area. So basically, there's going to be a lovely algorithm in a sec that says we've got X number of pixels and, you know, you're going to have Y algorithm and you have to have a focus indicator that has a Z number of pixels, um, which is why that second example, which is just a... Uh, a really quick mock is sort of a 
folder um, underlying for, for the button just to give you a bit of an idea. So that's the first part of easy to see. And the second part of easy to see is good old contrast. So we're going to make sure that those outlines, you know, whether it's uh, um, enclosing or underneath or what have you, has good contrast. <laughs> um, so first one, first one, sorry, I do need to keep near the microphone for the um, computer, so I might actually move a little bit because I know I keep um, facing away from it. So first of all is just a little bit of digging into what we call that area of focus. So um, in this particular case, we're saying that if we have greater than or equal to four CSS pixels, thick, uh, a four CSS pixel thick line along the shorter side of a minimum bounding box, that seems to be out of order. Let me just go, that is definitely out of order. And that thing out of order. That just makes it 10 times more difficult to do this, considering it's my worst criteria. Okay, I'm going to jump around a little bit and start here because that's where I wanted to start. Okay, let's we'll start here. So, sorry about that. I, somehow, it's, as I said, there's so many little intricacies to that one, and obviously, I confused myself. Um, so, if your uh, focus indicator is actually surrounding um, the button, we do need to do two contrast checks. Now, the first contrast check is that there is a contrast ratio of at least three to one between the same pixel in the focused or unfocused state. So if we take our example, yeah, we've got a focus outline around the button. That is the focus state and that is a dark gray. In the non-focused state, the equivalent pixel, so basically, you know, the exact equivalent pixel is just our background color. It's just a, a white color. So what we're looking at is comparing that white color to the dark gray and making sure it has more than a three to one pixel. Um, sorry, a three to one contrast ratio. And in this case, because it's all the same color, we only have to do one contrast check. So we just need to do the contrast check against the gray and the white. The second contrast check is quite similar. Uh, so once again, it's at least a contrast ratio of three to one, but it's against the adjacent non-focused indicator colors. Is there any way to make that simpler? So it's basically, if we take our outline, our dark gray outline, we have our background color, which is white. And then because that outline is exploded a bit out, so it's not against the button, which is a teal color, then that second color is also white. So that's what we're comparing. But if we actually had two white colors, um, so if, for instance, that outline is hugging the button, then we actually have a, we have to do two contrast checks and they both need to be at least three to one. I told you it was a pain of a success criteria to work through. Here, a white on gray, it's a 10 to one contrast ratio, so it's clearly. By comparison though, here's that second example. If that outline is sitting against the teal, so it's just a few pixels wider than the button, it's just making the button a bit fatter, we actually need to um, look at the dark gray against the white background and also the dark gray against the teal. So, so dark gray, white background, dark gray, teal, because there's basically they're the two colors that are butting up against each other. In this case, white, dark gray, all good. Teal, dark gray, not so good. So it's a contrast ratio of 2.5, 2.15 to 1. So this one actually fails. So if we wanted to do this, and to be honest, this is not the best user experience, I would definitely always suggest you actually have that focus indicator that has that extra sort of color. You can see how much easier it is to see. So yeah, this one I would say, you know, this is the strict what the success criteria says we can do, provided that we fix that teal and, and dark gray color. 
in all honesty, from a design perspective, stick to that sort of outline with the nice, you know, bit extra. It saves you a whole world of pain. It saves your testers a whole lot of world of pain of working out, you know, how to test this and doing multiple contrast checks and what have you. It's just much easier, much better for the user. All right, so that's our first one. Um, now, our second one, so I'm going to jump around a tiny little bit, but this starts with our area of focus. So let's say we don't have a nice enclosed focus indicator like the examples that we've seen. We actually have to use a calculation to say what's the minimum number of pixels that my focus indicator needs to use. Uh, and this is the first algorithm we use, so it's more greater than or equal to one CSL CSS pixel thick perimeter. <laughs> pixel thick perimeter of the component. Basically, how many pixels are on the very, very outer edge of the button? It's much, much easier to say. So in our example here, we've got a button that's 20 by 60 pixels. So if we add 60 and 60, two long edges, 20 and 20, two short edges, we get 160. And then we minus four for the four corners because we've actually counted those twice. So we have 156 pixels to play with. <laughs> and basically you can do whatever you like with those 156 pixels. So you could put an outline, this one is 160 pixels. You could put a dotted outline, but provided that the actual dotted outline is 156 pixels, you can do whatever you really like as long as you need that. There is another one. <laughs> this is the one I think I was doing before, which was slightly out of order. Greater than or equal to four CSS pixels thick line along the shorter side of the maximum mounting box of the component. <laughs> So, um, if our component is 20 pixels in height and it's more than four CSS pixels, it's four by, two, four by 20, 80 pixels, we can use our 80 pixels on the left-hand side of this. Once again, this has actually been exaggerated and if you do it in practicality, probably not the best user experience for the person. Bit hard to see even so. And once again, we have to do all those contrast checks. So we're checking that once again, at least three to one for that focused and unfocused pixel state. So same thing in this case though, we've got a different um, contrast ratio because we're using a very light teal on the dark teal and it's got a four to one contrast. So it is actually okay. Um, but when we get to our contrast against adjacent colors, um, not so great. So uh, when you compare the very light teal against the white, it is way under its 1.24 to 1, so no good. Simple is best, I think, is what we're really saying here, both in terms of meeting this criteria and also from the best user experience possible. There is a little extra bit there that you'll see in that contrast check that says um, that the uh, focus indicator is no thinner than two CSS pixels. So once again, I consider this one of those get out of jail free cards. Just don't, just design what's best for the user and screw all the loopholes. <laughs> all right, whose job is it? Those poor designers. How many designers do I have? <laughs> About half, okay. Well, I'm not going to say poor designers. If you do it, you know, in a consistent way, you're okay. Don't go and learn this criteria. It's a pain in the butt. Okay, another one related to focus. Focus not on skewed minimum. Um, so this is a double A. We're actually going to have a triple A as well that's been introduced in Wicked 2.2. And this one we've summarized as when someone taps to an interactive element, the element is not completely hidden by other content. So pretty straightforward. It's gonna to apply to anyone who is a keyboard user, has low vision as well, perhaps as being a keyboard user. That's it's gonna benefit, yeah. So I've got a video here. Um, this first video is actually, I've moved the, um, the dishwasher bit to focus. So this is actually not gonna show the poor experience. This is gonna show, well, 
shouldn't say that, the website's very poor anyway. You'll see when you go through the focus indicator, it's very hard to see. But what you will see is when I hit play, as we tap through, I go to the compare checkbox, I go to the, um, the name, which is a link. Then I went down to that read 396 reviews. And I hit play that again. And just wait for a tick. Got to do it old school. Just compare, dishwasher, read, reviews, same thing there on the right hand side. We can see everything that has that I'm basically tapped to. If we go to the next video, um, as I tap through, because that reviews is sitting underneath the sticky nav at the bottom of the sticky notification that says concierge members earn up to $90 store cash, I can't see that review one. So perfect example here, element, or, you know, the element that I've tapped to completely covered by the sticky um, notification, that's going to fail this particular criteria. So let's just have a little bit of a look at the relationship between the AA and the AAA criteria. So the AA, as we've said, is the component is not entirely hidden. So unfortunately, a bit of it can be hidden. I pure a technical standpoint, if I can see a tiny bit of it, technically I can pass this. This is what I hate about with that. Um, but when we add the AAA criteria, it's basically phrased in an almost exactly the same way. But instead of saying that the component is not entirely hidden, it is no part of the focus indicator is hidden. So I need to be able to see the entire focus indicator. And we're back to our example with the focus indicator around the button. Now, one thing to remember with these criteria is the cumulative they stack. So when we do meet AAA, we're meeting all the level A's, all the double A's, and all the triple A's. So actually, if we want to meet both of these criteria, we have to, the component can't be entirely hidden and no part of the focus indicator is hidden either. So humility. Basically, that should get us actually a pretty good experience. That first one, not all the component is hidden. But we can't get the, the window. If there's a tiny little bit and a user can't see it and they're confused, then it's a poor experience, fix it. Uh, one that I think actually engineers probably have a bit more responsibility than design. I do think designers should need to consider this and it is kind of a design requirement, but the engineers and the way that they implement things is probably going to be critical to making sure that these elements don't sort of sit under that floating content and when I tap to it, I can't see it. So. Yeah, engineers get a look in here. All right, dragging movements. Double A, provide a single pointer alternative to drag and drop. Nice and simple. But I do want to call out. Um, so this one, you know, if you think about someone who might have limited dexterity, so might have difficulty with sort of dragging movements, uh, someone that might use a head wand, so a wand strapped to their head when perhaps they're using it to either tap on a keyboard or tap on a touch screen. This is about making sure that, that people who use those types of technologies and maybe other assistive technologies as well can actually do the, the drag and drop motion without needing to sort of drag and drop the information. So anyone who's a head wand like me knows the 2.5.1 pointer gestures, which came in at Wicked 2.1, talked about path-based gestures. And we all went, all right. And then we started to dig in and go, what is a path-based gesture versus a dragging movement? And then we all got totally confused and talked about it and came to a conclusion. And there's lots of debates out there. If you go onto the GitHub Wicked sort of um, stuff you see, all sorts of um, people discussing this. But I think it can be summarized as when we have a path based gesture, the middle point matters. So we've got our starting point and we've got our end point. If it matters which direction and that you've got a middle point that you must go through to actually do the action, 
should notice these, these images do come from the WCAG documentation. If we've got a point that we have to pass through in order for this action to be valid, to be recognised, that's considered a pathways gesture. If I can put, stick my mouse down, for instance, and zoom my mouse everywhere, you know, on the screen, and it doesn't really matter where it goes, and then I go to a final point and I go drop, and that's where I want to it to land, that's dragging movement. So that's where this particular criteria comes in. Ultimately, though, both criteria are the same in that we should be able to do it with what they call a single pointer. So single click, single click, you know. So that could be maybe I enter, if we think of a file explorer, which we commonly drag and drop things, there's another way I can do that. Perhaps I can go into a particular edit mode where I can select the thing I want to move, move it by just clicking on its destination and it drops there and I'm done. I don't have to do that whole drain movement. So, good old design. You gotta design it in. It's part of interaction design. <laughs> You might have different things and ways you need to, to organize or to, to um, put into the interface to make this work, led by design, implemented by engineering. Target size, minimum, double A, the criteria are kind of love to paint. So we actually have a target size AAA requirement, which actually aligns with things like the Google Material Design Guidelines and the Apple's HCI that all generally say that a touch target should be, one says 44 pixels, one says 48 pixels. Anyone who works in that sort of space will, will know that. And that's what the AAA criteria says that actually came in and we had 2.1. And then we decided to be more lenient and bring in a target size minimum, which is AA. And it says, or summarized, interactive elements must meet a minimum target size or have enough space between them. So it's applied because that always happens in any case. So what does this mean? Obviously, we're trying to make it easy for people to select the right thing, particularly if you've got buttons that are close to each other and don't have a lot of gap between them. You might actually um, activate the wrong button if you have limited dexterity, that kind of thing. So this criteria says minimum of 24 by 24 pieces. Goodness knows where that 44 by 44 went, you know, that's part of all those other guidelines. We're going to water it down. Sorry, I'm probably being a little bit too open with this, but <laughs> um, I kind of understand. Sometimes I do know, particularly on a mobile screen, having a 44 by 44, it can be challenging. So I should probably say, I understand why this is in there. And I kind of always summarize this as bigger is better. So go as big as you can, you know, without necessarily compromising things. But this criteria says if you have all of your interactive elements, whatever they are, buttons, links, form fields, you've got it. Uh, if they have a minimum of 44 by 44 CSS pixels, tick, you've met the criteria, off you go. And then there's a little extra bit. What if you have a touch target size that is less than 44 by 44 CSS pixels? Well, we would have a requirement for that, don't we? So in this particular case, then we start to get into that sufficient space thing part of this um, criteria. So let's say we've got an 18 pixel by 18 pixel button. And we've got what in WCAG terms they call the target offset. So essentially we measure the outer edge of a button to the nearest edge of the next button. Um, and so that gives us kind of a bit of an area there that we can work with. That's what's, what's called our target offset. And it works in any direction. So whether we've got buttons that are horizontal, vertical, as long as they're adjacent, and you know, we need to have a look at this. So what we want is for the that overall target offset to be 24 CSS pixels. So in this case, we've got an 18 pixel button, and then we've got six pixels in between, which I've done my math right. Uh, totals 24 pixels, tick, we met this criteria. So essentially, smaller target size, 
but a larger adding area essentially around it. It's, it's a dead area, it's not interactive. So that hopefully helps people to more easily interact with that control and not make a mistake. Mind you, still not ideal. That's still a damn small button <laughs> to be able to click <laughs> or tap or whatever it is. But once again, they've kind of put this in as a, as a, it's there, but I call it a loophole. What it does mean is, is that you can almost have the smallest button that you really want, as long as it's got the right, you know, padding and target offset and it needs 24 pixels, it's okay. Again, please let common sense override any of this particular thing. Uh, there are a few exceptions. So first of all, uh, if there is something that does the same thing on the page, so if we've got two buttons or two links that do the same thing, one actually meets this um, requirement, one doesn't, then we've at least got one way that actually has a good target sign. So we're done. And also inline links, so links within paragraphs. Obviously, it would probably affect readability if we actually bumped that up to 24 because then we have lots and lots of line spacing and what have you. So that's also exempt. Guess who's responsible? Design. <laughs> Design. Engineering are going to follow whatever design says, you know, they shouldn't need to make any decisions if design's done their job, uh, but they need to implement it. So there they are. And I think we're at our last one, which I really shouldn't put it up. My second, well, actually, I really like it. It is a very, very good criteria, but it's the second most complex, I would say, and that's accessible authentication. This one is summarized as a double A. We does have a triple A companion, which we'll talk about. But in terms of its double A remit, make it possible for people to authenticate themselves using either simple object recognition or without needing to remember, transcribe, or manipulate information. So two parts, we're going to unpack the first part first, that remembering, transcribing, and manipulating. So all of these are summarised in the WCAG criteria as what they call a cognitive function test. So something that you need to use your brain in order to do. That first one, remembering. So we need to remember information in order to authenticate ourselves. Passwords. Very good example. Any sort of pattern unlocks, so you might have on your phone instead of entering a password or the like, you know, how you've got that little pattern swipey thing that you need to do. Once again, you still need to remember what the pattern is. Um, and any of those personal security questions um, also might fall under something that you remember. So for anyone who has difficulty with memory, this is obviously going to be a potential issue. The next one, transcribing. So good old type of word or character, anyone saying capture? <laughs> uh, that can be difficult for someone who might have reading or literacy difficulties uh, that might transpose numbers when they're copying from one source to another. That's the kind of thing we're talking about here. And then lastly, manipulation. Bit harder to sort of remember, I think, the, the other two, you're like, yep, I'm going to get that. Manipulation could be anything that you might manipulate late or change information. So solving puzzles, um, you do occasionally get those as part of the caption, or um, doing calculations. So instead of your traditional captures where they say four plus three equals and you have to fill that in, that's also considered manipulation. So when it comes to accessible authentication, we do not want to have particularly the only method. There's definitely we can have multiple methods um, and some of them are going to need to be accessible and meet this criteria, but we certainly don't want to do the only method um, to, sorry, we don't want the only method to require you to remember, transcribe or manipulate information. So let's look at some common ways of authenticating and what it means for this particular criteria. Oh, 
yeah, got this wrong. <laughs> so that's one, just the good old username and password. Uh, nothing extra I've added here. We'll just go with sort of age and stuff. Now, first little thing to note is if your particular username, you'll notice I didn't include username in that previous example of information you remember. If your system allows for the username to be something that is personal common information, so something like your name, your email address, or your phone number, actually that's okay because that information doesn't change from site to site like a password does. So because it's sort of expected that someone will more than likely remember that personal information that they've sort of known most of their life. Phone number might change, but you know, it's definitely persistent information. So that would be the first thing if you're doing username and password, make that username something that's common and we tick that requirement. The second requirement, again, a little bit of a get out of jail free, but it's copy and paste. So making sure anyone, if it is um, not common information, like a password, they can copy and paste it in. That actually is all we need to do and we've solved this or we've met this particular criteria just for username password. And the last thing is also allowing password autofill. So whether someone has a password manager or they're using their browser to do the same thing, make sure you're not blocking that so they can actually use that technology to fill in their password. Fairly common these days. Don't find a lot of sites that block that, so that's pretty good. That's the easy stuff. Multi-factor authentication. And this is where it starts to get more tricky. <laughs> So if we have MMA, this is not going to cover every single example, but I sort of went through and had a bit of a think about it. One of the really common MFA um, uh, what, what, multi-factor authentication methods, that's what I'm start trying to say, is the text or call of a one-time password. Now, here's where it gets interesting. If I can copy and paste it, it has to be on the same device. At least for me, it's really common. I'm sitting there on my desktop. Da, 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 da. Oh, I have a one time password sent to me on my phone as an SMS. That is not going to fly under this criteria because it's I have to transcribe that information from my phone to the desktop. So it's only really if you can guarantee that the person received that one time password on the same device that they're on so they can copy and paste it, then we're okay here. We could also, though, use biometric verification. Uh, that doesn't fall into any of those other categories. Uh, other ways I've seen for multi-factor authentication is the USB stick. That's an interesting one, though, when I think about it. It's like this criteria doesn't go into all this, but USB stick, you kind of need an element of unique ability and potentially dexterity to use that. And if someone maybe is having difficulty with even, say, transcribe the one-time passcode and is it timing out or that kind of thing, do they have enough time to use the USB stick and they use it? I think there's all sorts of things you should consider here. But under this criteria, if you had a physical USB stick and everyone, but someone could use it all the time, you're okay. And then the last one, which probably is the best, I would say, other than maybe biometric verification. And but the problem I have with biometric verification, at least in the apps that I use, is that quite often after a certain period of time or something happens, it asks me to re-enter my password again. So if the, that's the case, we need to make sure, first of all, that we once again meet those previous criteria for the password in order to then re-enable the biometrics. So it's still possible. No issue, but it, this criteria particularly calls out that you have to have at least one path that you can take that meets this criteria. So, and that's where capture is going to be an interesting one. But that last one, the MFA, an authenticator app or links. So something that more doesn't ask, doesn't send you a one-time passcode, but more says, hey, you know, I'm going to send you something to your mobile phone, you know, are you you? Or did you sign in? You hit that on the mobile phone, you've signed in on the desktop, that's also okay. It doesn't have all any of those other things that remember um, transcribe or manipulate. So MFA possible. Probably need to think through them though if you're using it. 
There are other authentication methods, something like third party lab logins via OAuth. So that's when it says, hey, do you want to sign in by Facebook or Twitter or that kind of thing? That's also acceptable and as well as web auth as well. <laughs> so we need an option again for this is that doesn't rely on a cognitive function test. So this is where it gets quite interesting because let's look at recapture through. I'll say I'm not a expert in recapture three. So if you're an expert here and anything that I say, you think, oh, she's not quite on the mark there and do call out because I've read the documentation, but I can't say I use it and implement it and that kind of thing. If we think about something like capture, recapture two, recapture three, you know, usually you've got that I'm not a bot. So it either recapture two tends to have the tick box, I'm not a bot. Um, recapture three tends to more look for things and it might not present you with that tick box straight away. But if it does think you're a bot, and we actually do find that when you're using a screen reader or keyboard, we tend to find anecdotally it's triggered more often um, that I'm a bot. Don't exactly know why, that's above my pay grade. But um, that usually triggers then the secondary authentication. And that's where it starts to get interesting. Um, ooh, my computer is running out of battery. That's not good. Um, me for one tip. Oh gosh, I can bring my. Oh no. Yeah. <laughs> online I actually forgot my charger which is very bad so I'm gonna hopefully finish this up soon and then we'll go to plan B change that okay so back to capture it thinks you're a bot and it presents you with something if it presents you with a object recognition that whole fire hydrant that kind of thing under level AA, that is actually okay, but under AAA, a AAA requirement, which we'll have a look at in a bit more detail in a sec, that's not really okay. What's then more interesting is if I am a person who's blind, usually then the option is that I go to audio capture if I'm presenting with visual capture, which is obviously not going to work. So once again, that actually now falls under transcription and it fails the criteria. Recapture 3, you can actually have email authentication, which is going to be your safest callback option or options, doesn't mean you can't present multiples, that actually does meet this particular criteria. So once again, it is possible, but you do need to sort of think through some of these things and make sure you do select the right options in order to get past the capture without this criteria. So I mentioned difference between AA and AAA. So one is that object character recognition. Um, and the second one is personal content. So under AA, it kind of has this wonderful weird thing because I think we only in my team remembered one example of where this happened on Facebook, where if you upload your own images, it might say which image is yours, as in which one have you actually uploaded, which one did you take, which one did you, you know, it's your own personal content. And if you could recognize that, that's actually a form of education maybe. Hardly ever seen it in the wild, but that actually is not um, allowed at AAA, but it is allowed at AA. Everyone's responsible. <laughs> and I say this just because this is such a tricky area. It touches on security in such a major way that I actually think it's not just your designers or your developers or your content and your testers. It's that little other category that you're going to have to go and talk to security and risk and all sorts of different people in the organisation to make sure that anything you change or implement actually meets the criteria, provides better experience but also meets the security requirements. <laughs> so 
Just um, quickly, the, the three minor updates that we've got. So we've got one criteria that's actually a 2.01 purpose visible. It used to be a double A, it's now a little A, and that's to make room for focus appearance, which is coming in, which is a double A. Uh, there's a very sort of small rename, so it used to be target size, which is a triple A, it's now called target size intense because we have a minimum. And the new runner is 411 housing, which I'm not going to get into, but either way, the powers that they have said. It actually is obsolete. It was great back when Weekend 2.0 was released. It was necessary. Now it's not. So we're actually going to remove it. So, so what's next for Weekend? Obviously, we're hoping for it to be finalized in April and then we start to implement it. No, that's not it. <laughs> uh, anyone who follows Intopia may know about how we can map. It's kind of a little bit of a thing in the community. Everyone likes it. It's spread across the world. We will be updating this, so it's on our website permanently, so you will see the 2.2 come out. So if you're like, I want a visual representation of um, we have 2.2, watch this space. We are working on that as soon as it's, all these 2.2 stuff is finalized. So that's what's coming up. It's time to grow me. <laughs> and there goes my
Hello, people online. Um, Pranita, if you could give uh, Lila the ability to start video, it should be the three dots on the right hand side, and there's an option there. But either way, hopefully, everyone can at least hear me again. Uh, thank you to Lila for quickly popping her computer <laughs> on. Um, so the question was just how do we determine what those minimum contrast requirements are? So like three to one and that kind of thing, and what's the implications maybe if we don't meet them? And I was just saying that the contrast ratio, particularly in WCAG 2, is actually a bit of a contentious issue. So back when WCAG 2.0 was developed, they did do quite a lot of sort of research and there's quite a heavy mathematical algorithm that underpins how we get to those contrast requirements and what they believe are the minimums. So essentially, we usually have two requirements. It's either a minimum of 4.5 to 1, so that's for our paragraph text, and then uh, everything else essentially is a 3 to 1 because it's considered it's sort of a bit bigger or longer or it's, you know, doesn't have to have quite as high a contrast requirement. And this is talking just double A, triple A actually has a higher contrast ratio than that. Um, when I said it was contentious, there are quite a lot of people who go, there are some examples that you can clearly see it's with contrast, the ones I use like the dark grey and white or, or that kind of thing. It's like, look, that's, that's quite easy to see. But there are some colour combinations that do pass the contrast requirements. But when you kind of eyeball them, it's like, oh, <laughs> they really don't contrast well. Uh, so they are completely revisiting that contrast algorithm and the contrast ratios in WCAG 3. We're still probably a few years off, at least from WCAG 3, because it's quite a deviation from the WCAG 2 kind of approach and structure. Um, it actually is aiming to not be based in web, it's based in all technology. But that's sort of where that minimum contrast has come from and the acknowledgement that it's not always 100%, you know, fantastic. I think what we also, when we look at contrast to the other thing we're trying to do is get a high enough contrast so the majority of people, and, and you know, that does include people with low vision or other vision impairments, hopefully use the interface without needing to adjust things. Um, there's still going to be people that do need to adjust the interface. And that's, I guess, the flip side of the contrast argument, which is we want to make it probably, you know, to, to be useful or to, to be easily seen by as many people as possible, but that's not going to be everyone. And I think that comes from accessibility more broadly is that, you know, there is not one size fits all. And so that element of personalization or customization, which in this case contrast, or at least the use of colors and changing that background and foreground color and that kind of thing. That's the second part of what we consider, you know, for interface design. Wonderful. Um, I don't see any questions online, I don't believe. Um, Sarah, if you can hear uh, me. Yes. Um, so we've got one question from Ben. No worries. Uh, are there any updates regarding the pop-up? Pop-ups sort of like... Particular requirements for the pop-ups or like to avoid the minimizations. <laughs> So you're thinking pop-ups like mobile windows or? Uh, them like, for instance, the e-commerce or like sign up to this. Oh, yeah. So I think this is where you can, I can give you the technical WCAG answer and I can give you the usability answer. So when you do have a pop-up like that, it is possible to theoretically make it accessible. So things like, because um, usually those pop-ups are kind of like a bit of a modal, it's just that they're being surfaced usually without the user asking for them to, to pop up. So, you know, you haven't quite clicked on a button and it's opened a modal window, you've gone, hey. Um, so first of all, from a usability perspective, of course, it takes people out of context um, completely. So 
people that could be impacted, um, anyone who might have difficulty with attention or sudden changes that are unexpected are going to, to sort of difficulty with that. Um, we then also, I think, particularly your non sighted so your people that are blind that are, are using a screen reader are going to be impacted because they will be suddenly taken to this box and they have no context. They don't see it pop up. So they're going to have to kind of listen to the information and work out why the heck have I suddenly been taken once again out of context and I suddenly am in this box. Um, the same with people with, I think, low vision as well are going to be impacted by that too. If they sort of have got a narrow field of view or a zoomed in, you know, once again, that's going to be a problem. So there's all these things you can do to make it WCAG conformant. I would just say it's bad practice for usability. It's got extra implications for certain people with access needs and we just shouldn't do it. Had that feedback from people with dyslexia. Yep. They said sometimes it might even cause a seizure. Oh, okay. That's a that's an interesting one actually. I haven't come across that particular feedback. Um, maybe if it's flashing very quickly um, for some right. people. Like, yeah. Unexpected. Yes, yeah, yeah. And there is definitely, I attended a, or it was a, um, it was an alley camp presentation actually, and I must have been, I was, I was sitting there listening to it, and the presenters were saying, before they advanced the slide, they were saying, I am now going to advance the slide or something like that. And I actually, even though I'm into the industry, I sort of thought, gee, that's a little odd. Uh, and they had actually worked with someone who that progressing of the slide without actually the warning was really difficult for them. And so knowing this, this person, they actually had changed their way of presenting and actually gave a solid warning with, before the slide transitioned. So that's sort of another similar example of something that changed sort of unexpectedly. I mean, you know the slide's coming, but you don't exactly know when often. And yeah, that was that was a, a new one for me as well. Cool. Um, Sarah, if you can hear me, so maybe no, I, I can't see any questions coming through online. So any other questions from people here? Why to how? Um, are there any recommended channels, like ideal set of channels that you need to surface to both customers? For instance, you can surface the phone number, but if customers are hearing impaired, right. it's not going to work. Yeah. yeah. So the question was, are there any particular channels we would suggest for providing help? Um, an example given was a phone number might not work for someone who is deaf or a deaf person, I should say. Uh, so I don't think there's a definitive list, but I think the the core thing for any customer is the options. So as you mentioned, you know, a phone number may not be the um, channel of choice for a, a deaf person and, and also for other um, people. So some people, neurodiverse people, may actually prefer a digital channel over a verbal channel. So having those different options that people can get help where it could be, do I use voice um, and, and do I interact with a person or not? Um, do I interact synchronously or asynchronously? So, you know, I want to respond straight away and if I maybe and too long responding perhaps then you know if it's a if it's a human sort of chat they might you know close your call but you're actually just needing more time to respond so think about the sync versus async methods contact forms are good sort of async method um some of those yeah more human chats are good sync methods but you don't have to actually speak to someone you can use you know sort of that um um, you know, typing uh, essentially in order to get that response. So that's what I'd say is, yeah, multiple channels are thinking through those different ways that people might want to. Some actually do prefer calling someone up. And even that for me and, and any of these channels, when we're working with organisations, one of the things that I often find is overlooked is the customer support centres. 
So if you do have someone that rings up and let's say, you know, I hate using screen read users, they kind of get used so much, but there is quite, you know, if someone rings up and says they've got, um, you know, they can't do something or they're having difficulty completing a task and what have you, and, and they're a screen reader user and perhaps the way they describe things or the language that they use, you know, how is that um, customer support person going to, first of all, I mean, disability sort of sensitivity training um, is what a lot of organisations or awareness training, there's sort of different names for that but that would be the first thing so if you do get a customer with um you know different access needs disabilities or that kind of thing first of all that you start up on the right foot let's say uh because often if someone is calling up a customer support center they usually have not been able to do something and they start off annoyed <laughs> so being respectful and and you know knowing um you know some of those any kind of language elements to it is then a good starting point then for me, the second part is that although not every single customer support um, person may know how to solve the issue, having a clear escalation process, oh, I've got a um, person here who's a screen reading user, I can't help them because I'm really not sure. And I've, I've been on the other side where the, the, the sort of issue gets sent through to me as the accessibility person to go, hey, we've had so-and-so ring up, they're having the, this difficulty. What information can you collect from them? Um, and to pass on then to someone who can maybe look into it and go, oh, yes, I can see what's happening. And then, you know, work out, is there, you know, is it a hard blocker? What are you going to do about that? Um, is it maybe that there is a workaround that you can help the person or guide the person to, but there is still an issue there? Is it maybe the person just needs a bit of support? That's, you know, it's just a, oh, actually, we can't do this, but, you know, we just need to guide the person through. But then it's about using the right language groups. So you don't want to say, click on the button with the um, the bell icon, you know, it's going to have a, a name to, to that button that is going to be, you know, going to come through for the screen reader. So, you know, there all those are flow on elements, I think, of channels, particularly those ones that are not just frequently asked question pages and support pages that you can see that one. That was a long-winded question too. <laughs> what was probably a shorter question. Let me go. It's a case when uh, someone called the customer service and because someone had some speaking problems mm -hmm. and so they used this uh, robot voice. Yes. And that was considered as a, you know, as a good luck, not as a human. Mm -hmm. And so that person tried actually tried to open the car and couldn't. Yep. And so he was particularly like, Enough. Like no one believed that it's a real person. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, when he tried to do it online, there was no but there was a requirement to sign twice. Right. And some physical mm -hmm. uh, stability, uh, he couldn't actually repeat the same signature. Right. What actually caused that to act physically go to the office? Yeah. Practically. Yeah. Very yeah. Yeah. How could you uh train and uh, what would you suggest to customer service in this case? Like, <laughs> hey, this is a real one. <laughs> oh, that's a curly one. All right, I'm just going to summarize for those people still hanging out online. So, um, someone approached a customer service center who was using um, speech synthesis uh, and uh, couldn't complete the process. Um, because of the speech synthesis and then there was a question of whether it was a real person on the other end or not. They then went to complete the online process and needed to sign twice and because they had a mobility impairment, couldn't replicate the signature twice to a point where the system would recognise that uh, and then had to fall back to going into a branch which or, or a, a, a um, drink some water, which they weren't terribly happy with. <laughs> Does that summarize? Well, um, okay. I don't think I have, I don't think I actually have a solution for that. The bit though that's jumping out to me is, and I don't know the context of this, but that use of the signature is probably one of, out of everything, 
not sure about that first part in the use of the speech synthesis and whether that was using you're using voice recognition sort of to go through that process so if that's the case then yeah that's an interesting one I don't um I mean, it's sort of where technology clashes again. Technology, if we're using technology to recognize the voice and it's not recognized, it's synthesized voice, then that's sort of a technological issue. That second part of the process, I think I would sort of go, was the signature absolutely necessary? Was the duplication, the, the, the dual signature and the matching of the signature needed? Um, I do come across quite a few forms that still sort of rely on signatures today that you know that online sort of signature thing that really we've got better methods in order to have people be able to authenticate or opt in or, or whatever it is so that would probably be that second part of things that might make it more accessible to someone to a person in that particular situation and then I guess we've got that third part which is the bricks and mortar which is always tricky because sort of like the the you know what I mentioned with when you ring up and you've got a complaint you know you're already kind of annoyed to start with and for a person for this particular person they probably also felt discriminated against at this point as well and so I think to go into somewhere bricks and mortar and if they did have maybe a mobility impairment the other question is how feasible is it for them to be able to go into a store or that kind of thing and complete that process so I think we need to sort of peel back probably from ultimately we don't want to have them have to fall back to the store so then the next part of it is the online process and looking at that signature element to it and why yeah why that signature is needed and most of them look no I shouldn't say I'm not a legal advisor but I think most of the time there are other ways to allow someone to authenticate. Yeah. Okay. Um, we, oh, no, we, did, we actually haven't shared it on the screen. So just to share a comment um, uh, someone made, uh, me too about the robot voice. I was stuck up with customer service and interpreters are pretty hard and take a long time to wait for. Um, love to understand from you and teach me to understand and follow the information right. <laughs> w WCAG is uh, hard. <laughs> I will I will acknowledge that. <laughs> uh, any further questions? I don't think I've missed any. Um, oh, no, we do have a question here from online. Do you recommend overriding default browser or operating system focus visuals for all? So it, that actually was a point I didn't call out is that under the focus appearance success criteria, if you don't touch the focus indicators whatsoever, so you just use the browser defaults, um, that doesn't apply. So it only applies if you do create custom focus indicators. In relation to this, I think there's two schools of thought. I do fall one way, but whether it's the right way is a different question. So um, there is the, well, look, if you leave the focus indicator as it is, someone can override it. They can apply their own focus style and focus indicator, and therefore it's super robust because it's essentially using the default and then they can change it to whatever they like. That's one school of thought. We do have a bit of a problem where not all the default focus indicators that come with the different web browsers are terribly accessible to start with. So often they're a bit lightweight or back in the day when Chrome had the light blue glow, it didn't meet contrast requirements. So I think actually when we went through some of these we had criteria and in particular those ones that do talk about the defaults, we almost felt like there was also a little bit of a push towards the browsers to do a little bit more of the heavy lifting. Um, just the way things were written and that kind of thing. We, we So my team and I have had 50 sessions unpicking with that criteria, not just the 2.2 ones, which we have done recently or redone again, but actually all of the criteria. So we get into the real nitty gritty. I remember have, us having that conversation about 
we thought there was a bit of an extra pressure on the web browsers. So that's one school of thought. The other school of thought is that you do you, you create your own. Um, the reason I probably lean towards the creation of your own, and you do need to make sure they do work, like for instance, in high contrast or that, but the reason I lean towards that is because if the browsers have a, you know, a focus indicator that's not very easy to see, it relies on someone knowing how to actually create their own custom or have their own custom style sheet or that kind of thing. And I would say for the average person, they would have no idea. So I tend to lean towards that, let it, let's create custom focus indicators, particularly given that the browsers aren't always that great, you know, at um, creating focus indicators that are clearly visible. If the browsers do fix that, then actually I'd probably change my view to, yes, let's just rely on the default. It's less work for us, both design-wise, although having a bit of a marketing background, I know every opportunity is a brand opportunity, including our focus styles. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, that aside is really about the, the customer or the user experience. But, you know, yeah, that's sort of where I sit currently, Ben. Oh, we've got another one. What are the good thing? Well, oh. Uh, what are the good thing? One of the good things I think that is that Internet Explorer did was have a black and white um, dashed default focus indicator. You could see it no matter what color background. Yes, that is true. I think it was a little light. The, the dash was always a bit light, but there is definitely for people working in design systems, there's kind of a sort of almost, um, it, uh, it's probably a technical term, but that double ring um, sort of approach that people are taking so that if you do have focus indicators that either are on a light background or a dark background and it changes depending on where these elements are used on, on the page, that is something that we're seeing more of these days so that then, yeah, it's sort of a bit of the, that's the same approach as what Internet Explorer took, you know, many moons ago, but um, it's definitely a bit bigger and not that because IE was super light. It was, it was dotted, but it was terribly, terribly light. So in my view, still a little bit easier. Uh, it's a little bit hard to see. Um, more questions? Gee, I, the, the, my slide of, you know, grill me is not up there, but by golly. <laughs> you can tell I absolutely hate it. She's fantastic. <laughs> I think I'm out in the in the physical world and I'm not seeing any in the online world so I don't think no I reckon that's a wrap I have no idea what time it is but all I will say is thank you for hanging out with me allowing me to both share and rant about we <laughs> Well, good. Well, uh, thank you to everyone who joined online. We will be closing up in just a sec.